Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Well, greetings to everybody from around the world. It's the afternoon here. The weather in the UK is not good, uh, but we won't uh, linger over dis discussing that. Um, this afternoon, we have a um, presentation by Frank Walton of um, registered envelopes, early Q QE2 period. First of all, my welcome to all members and also in particular to uh, guests from the Postal Stationery Society and members of the Royal who have attended this meeting for the first time. That's Tom Steenbachers, uh, Ram Mohan, Robert Marion, Peter Horlick, and Elmar and Ute Dor. A very warm welcome. We hope you enjoy the meeting and that you will join us again for future meetings. Now, most of you will know the name Frank Walton. He's a secretary of the role of distinguished philatelist, a past president of the Royal Philatelic Society London. Um, he has had uh, several philatelic interests. He's also been editor of the London Philatelist for a number of years. And uh, I welcome him to do this presentation. And without any further words from me, over to you, Frank, for your presentation on early QE2 registered envelopes. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Richard. Can I just check with the thumbs up that the screen has been shared properly? I can see it perfectly, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I use this, uh, this flash screen to start off with uh, at a display uh, some months ago. Uh, I just love that photograph. The, the left-hand side of the photograph is looking straight down the stairwell at 15 Abchurch Lane. And I'm sure there are many people on the call who've never actually been to Abchurch Lane yet. But the only thing I'll say about that photo is, it's actually taken before we spent several million pounds renovating the building. So if you've not been there yet, I can just, uh, you're in for a big surprise and deep joy when you finally see what a splendid headquarters we now have. Um, right. A um, bit of background, uh, QE2 envelopes, well, they came in, perhaps inevitably when the king died, um, but they didn't actually, it was a bit of a, a, bit of a gap. Um, the post office took the view that we really ought to get the adhesive stamps uh, out there first, which is what happened. Um, very, very soon after the king died, Dorothy Wilding uh, was sent over to the palace to take some photographs of the new queen. Um, and in fact, those, those photographs actually did form the basis for the head that you're going to be seeing a lot about today. So the, the outline of the head was used uh, from the Wilding photograph. And, and the artist chosen to uh, design the die for the stationery was somebody called Cecil Thomas. Now, until I started collecting this material, I'd, I'd never actually heard of the name Cecil Thomas, I must be honest. And uh, you know, everybody knows the name Dorothy Wilding, but, but who's ever heard of Cecil Thomas? Um, so what we're gonna do is just introduce ourselves to Cecil. He was actually, um, he lived to a ripe old age, as you can see from his dates there. Uh, and he was a well-known uh, sculptor in the UK. But when I started digging into this, I was astonished and delighted to understand that it was actually Cecil Thomas who had done all the design work for the first series of Royal uh, Medals. So we'll talk about the Tilliard, the Crawford, um, and the Tappling Medals back in 1920. It was actually uh, Cecil Thomas who did that design. He also did the design for many um, coins around the, around the British Commonwealth, including the British, um, uh, the British florin, or the two shilling piece, as you call it. So this is the Crawford Medal. This actually uh, is taken from a very high res photograph uh, from uh, the medal in the Royals Museum. Uh, sorry, the Spear Museum of Philatelic History, I have to give it its new proper name. Um, this was awarded to Grebear. It's the first one. Uh, we couldn't believe our luck when this came on the market. Um, and also thank uh, Chris King for the photograph. So there's the medal. I don't know if the eagle-eyed amongst you have spotted this little bit down here. Let me just try and blow that up, this, this bit here. Well, what we've actually got is um, a, a monogram in, in the bottom there of the corner. You can have a corner of a circle, probably you can't, can you? <laughs> so we've got this little bit of here. And just to make it a bit clearer, uh, we have CT for Cecil Thomas. And it took me a little while to decipher the rest of the mon monogram, but in fact, it's the year 1920, uh, which is what he did, uh, when he did it rather. So we reversed the nine and he just moved it up and put it in the middle there. And that's where we get this monogram. Uh, and this is actually in all of the, the first three medals the world now still award today. We still use the same die. 
um, which is quite nice. Um, Elizabethan coinage, this is a, a two shilling piece, uh, a florin as we call it in the UK, or used to rather, 1953. Now, can you just begin to look at the design in the middle here? Uh, what have we got? Well, we've got a Tudor rose. And uh, if you look again, uh, very carefully in the middle of this, you've got uh, some little scribbles and I'll blow those up for you. And uh, you can actually see the initials here, EF and CT. Well, EF was for Edgar Fuller, who uh, shared the design work with uh, Cecil Thomas. And of course, we've got CT for Cecil Thomas. So um, trying to mount one of these into my uh, exhibit of this subject was actually good fun. Have you ever tried to work out how you mount a coin into a stamp exhibition? A bit challenging, but there we go. So um, I'm going to just go sideways for a moment and actually uh, uh, talk about the Cecil Thomas archive. Now, um, one of the great joys I love of QE2 philately as a whole, this is true of um, the, the, the actual adhesive stamps, the Wildings, um, the Her Majesty has got a lot of the Prusen essays and the ones she doesn't have are in the Postal Museum in, in, uh, in London. Now, however, there is a third source of this sort of material, and that is the, the artist's personal archive. And the Cecil Thomas archive remained in the family uh, until relatively recently, just a decade or so ago. And I wasn't around in the right place at the right time when it did come onto the market, but I did uh, acquire it in entirety um, about three years ago which has given me a fantastic opportunity to study this, this material very closely. However, there's one item which I don't have, and that's this. Uh, what that is, is um, it's, it's a 25 centimetres, about 10 inches square, um, or circular even, and, and the, the person who actually bought the archive, um, he wasn't allowed to have it on his study wall, um, so he actually uh, donated it to the Royals Museum, uh, and that is where it still is today. So my thanks to uh, Nicola for sharing a photo, high res photograph of the, the said item. This is actually a plaster cast stuck onto the middle of a, a heavy card design and the rest is all hand painted. So this is the original artwork. Why is it eight pence halfpenny? It, all the essays and proofs, the original essays and proofs are all value eight pence halfpenny, which may seem rather a strange uh, value, but of course what that is, it's two pence halfpenny uh, for the postage and six pence for the registration. And all of the envelopes had a single combined fee applied to them. So eight months eight was the original one. Right, so Cecil Thomas managed to get the contract um, for doing the artwork for the design of the embossed head. But of course he'd already, already got a winning piece of artwork which he used for the British coins only the year before. And I, I can only imagine this guy was very uh, commercially astute and I'd like to think he probably got paid twice once by the Royal Mint and once by the Royal Mail. A clever piece of uh, negotiation, I'm sure. But you can see here, the outline of the, uh, the die is actually the same as the outline of the, uh, the inside elements of the coin. So, one thing I actually really struggled to get across when I was putting this presentation together is, uh, is an element of size. Now, if you see the word proof um, on these slides, then that is actually uh, something that is struck as at the image that was actually appeared on the envelope. So a proof is literally stamp size in effect. However, all of the essays were done photographically. So in, we're now reaching the point where cameras have become much more uh, usable in, in artist design work. So what he would do, he would uh, take a photograph of something you printed, he would then um, print it again, uh, perhaps anything between stamp size up to perhaps uh, maybe 15 centimetres across. He'd print it and then he'd retouch it with uh, either black ink or, or white ink. So, and then he'd re-photograph it. So many of the, the actual essays are all different sizes. So that's, it's really difficult to get across on this sort of presentation and want to scale. But if you do go on to, um, uh, onto the Royals website, you'll see there's actually a, uh, a five frame exhibit of mine on this subject, actually there available to download. If you don't know where to find it, ask Mark and he'll send, uh, send you a link. Um, but what that does do, it actually tells you, you can see in, in, the, 
in a stamp exhibit type frame how big each of these essays are. So to answer my own question, these are around about 10 centimeters across. These are the ones I'm just about to show you now. So what we got here, this is one of the very early essays. And you can see there's, there's no inner circle around the Queen's head. Um, and then we've got one here. This is another essay. This time it's got the repeating the rose design. This is very similar to what they did with the florin, where he got the, the outer Tudor rose loops, and then he also put an inner one in. And the third one here is um, the one which is actually very close to the issue design with, with a single white circle here. And I was um, uh, showing some of this material to Steve Harrison um, uh, a couple of days ago, and he pointed out something I never actually spotted. Uh, but you can see, I think you can see my mouse moving, there's, there's a tail on the end here, and also a tail on the A. But of course, when he actually uh, put in the various designs, he had to curtail the tails from the letters. And this is actually the final issued one. And you can see the, the letters all, all fall short of the white circle. So this is genuinely trying things out as you, as you would do when you're playing around with the designs. These are proofs, so they're stamp size. Um, so the one on the left is a progressive proof uh, just before he put any lettering into the uh, master die. And the one on the right is actually, um, these are, they're hand painted letters, would you believe? And these are stamp size. Um, so you can just begin to see, um, I mean, how on earth would you ever start writing on a circle that big, not knowing quite how the wording is going to end and to finish them all off at exactly the place you started? I think it's quite a miraculous piece of uh, artwork. It's certainly well beyond my ability with a pen and pencil, I tell you. Uh, you wouldn't know how many times you did it, <laughs> but there we go. Um, Colour trials. I think this is actually my favourite uh, favorite uh, section of the exhibit, where these are all colour trials from, these are all from the master die, um, actually, and they're just playing around a load of colours. And I don't know quite who had a vote in what they picked, but they actually picked the ones on the uh, bottom right hand corner, the dullest grey, battleship grey you could ever wish to meet. And somebody somewhere had a plan, but I have no idea what that plan was. Um, I personally would, I love that red one. I think it's just super. Uh, but no, they went for Battleship Grey. Such is life. So, um, the envelopes. Uh, going right back to Victorian times, the, the UK had actually established a, a standard set of four envelopes. Of course, standards are there to be, um, uh, to be broken, but typically we see uh, these four different sizes of envelopes. And uh, guess what? They've been known to flat list by the letter codes F, G, H and K. And you can perhaps work out where the lettering came from. <laughs> they're actually, there they are uh, in full glory, actually on the envelope itself. And these sizes uh, prevail throughout. They did change a bit towards the latter part of the Queen Elizabeth reign. Um, but I'm afraid this is all to do with the K size envelope. And the K envelopes were very heavily used by the legal profession. And uh, at one point they actually made the design a bit smaller and the legal profession was up in arms because they couldn't get their thick documents in them. So guess what happened? They reverted back to the original larger size in due course. So die numbers. It took me literally about three days to put this one slide together. You'll see why in a moment. The die number um, is actually bedded, buried in the bottom of this, this image here. What they did, they, they created a master die for each value. So um, uh, in this case, it's one and three, which was a few years after the eight pence halfpenny rate. And what they did, they would create a master die. And then they would make subservient dice from that. Um, sometimes they'd make 20 or 30 different dies, but they always put the die number in the neck. But I'm afraid, generally speaking, they're almost impossible to read. Um, but this photograph here was taken with an immense amount of side light um, so that you can actually begin to see the shadows. Um, and this one's actually number 47, which there's an attempt at blowing it up and there's a cheating one with a bit of red ink on it. So the die number is in the neck of the design. And why is that important? Well, actually it's good fun because what they did do, um, they reserved particular die numbers of each value for use on the stamp to order envelopes. So, let's say there'd be three or four different numbers uh, reserved and not sent to, uh, the, to the Corkadales who made all the envelopes, but they actually sent them to Somerset House where 
commercial organisations could actually, or indeed philatelists, could take their own pieces of blank paper in or blank envelopes in and actually get them stamped uh, for a fee. Um, and the biggest commercial user was Barclays Bank. And you do find those, and the ones on the market are all actually addressed to uh, the company of Levitt, who just happens to be the, the family business of uh, a former uh, past president of the Royal. Um, so the only ones I've ever seen are addressed to Levitt's company. Uh, clearly, he was saving things out of the way of them, but they're generally in commercial usages, and quite rare thus. Okay. What this is trying to show is the, the problem the post office didn't quite see coming. So if you look at uh, the, the five reigns we've got here, or indeed half the reign of uh, Queen Elizabeth, you can see how many different values there were during the reign. So in 61 years, Queen Victoria only ever needed one value. The restoration fee after it was introduced was the same. And guess what? In Edward the VII period, it stayed the same as well. And then it be did begin to start uh, increasing the frequency with which they changed the die. So by the time we get through to the first 20 years of Elizabeth's reign, um, they were changing the die about once every six months. Um, and that began to be a problem because unlike um, more normal stamp production, it actually took quite a long time to develop a new die. Um, oh, and by the way, there's something which uh, was quite relevant here. Cecil Thomas actually had the, in, written in the contract that he was the only person allowed to make changes to his die. So every time the rate changed, he got another ka-ching moment and they paid him a bit more money to do the artwork for the new values. Clever businessman, this guy. The first time the rate changed, um, the open safety, as I said, uh, was a total of top of safety postage and six months registration. Um, but they increased the registration fee up to a shilling uh, in June 1956. But they did a bit more than that actually. What they did do, they very generously increased the amount of compensation you got for the loss on envelope. It went up from five pounds to 10 pounds on the same day as the fee doubled, which seems quite reasonable. But of course, very few people made the claim, but that's by the by. Um, but of course, what it meant was that the post office needed a new die for one of Thomas Haveney. That's Thomas Haveney posters plus a shilling for the, um, for the restoration. But the problem they had is that they literally had millions, and I do mean millions, of eight and safety envelopes in stock. These were uh, in three different places. One is in customers, uh, you know, people like Barclays Bank would go and buy a thousand envelopes. So they actually had them in customer stocks or in private individuals had them. There was another set of stock uh, actually behind the counters in post offices. And there was a third stock, which was the bulk, actually in post office stores. Uh, and they literally did have millions of these. And they said, well, I'll tell you what, we need to use all those up before we can actually um, start thinking about getting a new design for the one to save the envelope. So there were four ways which they actually used, um, or they, they marked the fact that it was going to be one to save me. The first one is that, and this, this was uh, the case in the first two categories, that's uh, envelopes in stock in private individuals' hands all behind the counter in the post office, they simply stuck a six month stamp on. And that is such a simple solution, it worked. But the post office uh, counter clerks were not allowed to sell them at eight months heavy anymore. They, they could only sell them with the additional uh, wilding adhesive stuck on. Second one was uh, the post office realized that these millions of envelopes in store they couldn't possibly do them themselves. So they decided to send them back to McCorkadales, the printers. And McCorkadales, uh, and the, the, um, the archive is very clear on this, McCorkadales actually, uh, and I do apologize, I'm gonna offend anybody now, they actually recruited a load of women to actually do this work. And the archive is very clear on this. Why? Because in the 1950s, women were paid less than men. So they actually deliberately recruited women to do it because it was repetitive labour, uh, taking several sh millions of sheets of stamps or whatever, and actually ripping them up and actually sticking them in the envelopes uh, before they were then sold, uh, distributed back to post offices. Oh, but hang on a minute, this was so much work. What McCall Goodells did, they developed a machine. So what we've got is a machine doing it as well, and more of that in a moment. And the third alternative, this was a uh, six months down the line now, 
they actually took several of the um, several hundreds of thousands of the uh, eight pence halfpenny envelopes and they overprinted them with a sixpence design. And also, they actually printed some new ones using the eight pence halfpenny dies, uh, but this time they changed the blue ink on the envelope to print the sixpence up up rate at the same time. And finally, they they decided, well, I'll tell you what, we'll we'll actually build a new die. But all this took a long time, took over a year to get all this through. So, two envelopes here. First one we used in August 56, and the other one used in September 56. This is where you're really good and get your grandchildren involved and you play spot the difference. Can anybody see the difference between these two envelopes? One was used in August and one in September, right at the beginning of this period. Let's have a closer look. That's a blow up of the same two envelopes, the same way around. Let's have a really big blow up of the two envelopes. Can you begin to see the differences now? The one on the left, which is the earlier one, has actually got uh, torn perforations on all four sides of the stamp. So this is a sheet stamp. Somebody's just ripped up and stuck the stamp on. The one on the right has got a straight edge, guillotined top and bottom. Okay. So everybody's saying, they're shouting at me, I'm sure, saying, well, this is just a coil stamp. Well, no, it isn't. <laughs> The only sixpence wilding coils were actually vertical coils, and they got straight sides with a torn top and bottom. So these stamps are the wrong way around. How, where does that come from? How do you get your brain around that? So you start reading all the stamp catalogues and the learned journals on this subject, and you don't find anything at all. And this is where rereading all the post office archives actually begins to get the story. And what, what happened was that the Corkerdales actually were sent a load of sheets of stamps out of post office stores and they put these stamps through a massive series of guillotines to cut them up and in essence they made horizontal coils and these horizontal coils were loaded into a machine and he went chug 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 rip one off stuck it on so if you find a stationary envelope with uh, stamps on it cut top and bottom it's one of these that was actually done by McCorkerdales using a stamp of fixing machine. Again, the same post office archives talks uh, in great detail about the production of the 1957 uh, commemorative um, first day covers for the, the Scouts Chamboree in uh, Southern Coldfield. And they use actually the same machine there. And those stamps uh, can be found on, on covers with straight, uh, um, straight sides rather than torn off sheets. I must thank um, Mark Johnson uh, for giving me the image of that coil, coil leader. Um, I've actually got some of the stamps in a coil, but I don't actually have the leader. So thank you, Mark. Okay, next transition, another eyesight test. Spot the difference. Well, if you're up to this, you will see the differences, but I'm going to cheat a bit and actually show the backs because all, most of the differences are on the back. <laughs> There is a difference on the front. This is, this is obviously folded over from the, the front, this portion here. You see here this line actually hits uh, halfway up the word registration, whereas this line on the second one actually uh, goes in a bit lower down the word registration. And the differences are quite simple. Um, this one here has got the five pounds um, conversation fee on the back, and this one's got the 10 pounds. And what the one on the left is, um, was the old stock of eight and seventy envelopes, and they just reprinted this double circle blue image onto a pile of them. These are actually quite rare. They only did it on the F size and the K size, uh, and they're not frequently encountered at all. And when they uh, got a bit further down the pile of the old eight and seventy envelopes um, with the with the pre-printed blue, they then reused the eight and seventy die which was the only one still in, in use because the one on top of the hadn't been finished yet. And they printed a, a new uh, blue image on all, all the envelopes. And this sixpence and all the rest of the back were printed at the same time. And finally, uh, we've got this um, one on top of the envelope used on its own. I have to say, this is probably one of the scarcest envelopes that you're going to find in this period. Why is that? Because um, the, the actual 
Uh, I've got this one. Oh, let me go back a bit. Sorry, I've gone too far. Uh, what you've got here is um, the, the way in which the dates worked. And they finally got the one on the the envelopes out in ready for circulation in the summer of 1957, a whole year after the rate change. And the, the rate was a shilling registration, Thomas Haley postage. But what they did right at the last minute in the summer of 1957, they actually announced the postage was going up to threepence, with effect from the 1st of October 1957. So the one on Thomas envelopes were actually finally ready in August 57. They were sent to post office stores in September 1957, but not actually put onto general release until October 1957, by which the rate had changed. <laughs> so finding a one and two percent envelope used in the right, right rate period is almost hen's teeth. And this one you'll see is actually used on the 30th of September 1957. So there's only a very small number of uh, post offices actually had these in the time frame which they could be used. Um, Alan Huggins actually tells me he's got some he sent to himself in 1957. That gives you a clue how long he's been doing this. But there we go. Right. Um, I'm going to go a bit faster now because there were, apart from the Apes of Hayden, there were actually uh, six other values ever used, uh, right up to the three, the three and four pence rate uh, that was towards the end of this period. Um, so we've got six uh, values, either proofs or essays, but Actually, if you look at these values, there's no one and three. And there's a two shillings and a penny halfpenny, which was never actually used. So we've got six further values and six different sets of proofs and essays, but they don't quite tally. There's one wrong. This one shouldn't, this uh, two, two shillings and a penny halfpenny shouldn't exist, or never was actually issued, and the one and three is missing. So why is that? Well, let's go for the two and a penny halfpenny first. Um, I don't know if you can see it, it isn't, it isn't terribly clear. Um, this is obviously a, a third or fourth generation uh, print photograph, print touch up photograph, um, print touch up. You know, they, they were iterative processes here. And the, the writing is actually quite faint. Um, but it actually says it's dated uh, July 1962. And, and down the bottom corner here, I don't know if you can make it out, but it actually says Cecil Thomas, and then it gives us his address on the old Brompton Road in London. Um, but this obviously, like all the rest, came from the, the, the Thomas archive. Um, but what it indicates is that the post office were very seriously considering raising the threepence postage rate to threepence halfpenny, but in fact they never did it. So the the whole of the um, the threepence two and a penny halfpenny essays were just thrown away, not used. But what about the one and three value? I've just been talking about uh, how quickly the one and three value was needed. It was very, very soon after the one and tuppence halfpenny was finally available. Um, but they, they had a large stock of those to use up, which delayed the uh, implementation of that. And I just said here, told you earlier, that there's a small number of offices used. Um, but they changed the postage rate. So they needed a one and three very quickly. So there's a pressing need, and they pressed the hurry up button. They hadn't got actually many one and tuppence halfpenny envelopes in stock compared to the eightpence halfpenny envelopes. But they still had a, a reasonable pile. So what did they do? They decided they would actually start the process to get the one and three envelopes made. And then they reread the small print and realized that Cecil Thomas was the only person allowed to do it. And he wasn't answering his, his telephone or his emails or whatever he's doing in those days. And he certainly wasn't uh, around. And again, there's a wonderful thick file in post office archives in this subject. And they finally established that Cecil Thomas was on holiday uh, for many, many months in the south of France at this period, which is why he didn't do anything. So I'm afraid what the archive doesn't say is actually who did the artwork, um, but I bet it wasn't Cecil Thomas. Therefore, I suspect he didn't get paid. Um, and just like I showed you the story of how sixpence values were actually uh, used to uprate the uh, eightpence halfpenny envelopes, I could repeat the whole series again with one and twopence halfpenny envelopes with halfpenny adhesives. Some were from sheets, some were from guillotined. Um, uh, processes from the call days themselves. Okay, what we got now? We got a load of uh, th these are the things which make a collection a bit more fun. Um, 
albinos. Well, what an albino is, is where the printing process was complete, but somebody forgot to put an ink in the box. So what you've got here, this one is actually very, very pale grey. It's, it's almost an albino. And for the purposes of this, it actually shows up much better than a real albino does. So basically, it's uh, been embossed, so it's been punched, um, but there's no grey ink. So you can see the design in albino format. And this one, I don't know if you can see this, but the, the, here's the, um, the blue circle. This is, uh, this is normally uh, all the blue writing is on the left-hand side, should be on the right-hand side as well. Um, but you can just see here, there's like an impression of a circle. You can just faintly see it. And there's a bit over here where the, inland, the word inland should have been is here. So again, this is albino, but it's the albino of the typography. So the gray portion worked, worked well in the print process, but the blue didn't. These are real, these are real missings. So there's no sign of any albino on this whatsoever. So we've got albinos and we've got missings. And this is where we, uh, these two examples here. This is probably the rarest actually. <clears throat> you know, the, the, if you look around and, and uh, search uh, eBay, etc., you might find one or two missings or albinos, but these doubles are incredibly rare. In fact, it's the only one I've ever had the chance to, to acquire. Um, and I still don't know how that happened. Um, you would have like to think that, and also did somebody pay six shillings and eight pence for it? Mm, I suspect not, you don't know, do you? Uh, moving on now, uh, just as I said, I was fortunate to actually acquire the uh, Cecil Thomas archive. Um, the, the chairman of McCorkadale's actually personally owned all the McCorkadale archive. And this came up, onto the market in one job lot again. And what this is, if you think about it, it's, um, this is a specimen envelope, the, the flap opens up so you can see the, the rest of the writing behind here. Um, and what this is, it, it's basically an agreement between the post office and the contractor, in this case, McCorkadales, that this sample is actually what we want. So yes, you produce this for us, this is an essay or a proof, the post office saying, yep, go ahead and please print 10 million of these. And what um, McCorkadales did was keep this sample. And therefore, it's a bit of a colour standard almost in Dullaroo Victorian times, if you know what I mean by that. And they overprinted them were specimen, so they couldn't be used. And it's um, uh, Samuel Huggins Type 21, uh, which, of course, doesn't appear on many other things. But as well as these envelopes, beautifully, we've got the letters to go with them. And uh, what this is, it's the in effect, the, the final agreement saying, yep, this is what we want. And beautifully, it actually gives you the issue dates as well. Now, um, again, th these are quite tedious and they're quite big if you put them into an exhibit. So you have to be think about how carefully you, you spread these out in the exhibit. Um, a bit of ephemera to finish off with. Um, most people who collect postal stationery actually strive to find what's known as the wrapper bands and uh, they're all color coded. Uh, sometimes the, the smaller ones, the Fs, were used uh, just blank white paper with nothing printed on it. But by and large, you can see these, uh, these came in bundles and people did used to buy packets of these, uh, these envelopes. And um, you know, the, they're all 12s apart from the Ks, the large ones, which came in sixes. And this is the, uh, the price you have to pay for them. And of course, these, these values changed uh, when the indicium value changed. So again, there's a whole whole collecting field of um, of trying to find these these labels, and these do come. You know, then they're, they're not particularly rare, but again, trying to get a complete set, where well, it's defeated me. I've got most of them. I haven't got them all yet. But these are really rare. What these are, um, these these uh, packets of um, of registered envelopes were put in bands, and then they came in things that looked a bit like a shoebox uh, from McCorkadales to post office stores. And each of these boxes had a label stuck on the end of it. Um, and I've only ever found four of these. Um, and there's, there's three of them. I've yet to find an F1. I've got two Gs, so I haven't found an F. And, uh, you know, if you've got any of these, I'll be delighted to relieve you off them. <laughs> and this, I don't know what this is actually. I, I bought it at the Postal Station Society auction uh, a couple of months ago. And what it does do, it beautifully gives us a release date. And it's just a, a post office notice. I'm sure it was a bit of a threat to post office employees. Um, the, the bad news is that 
there were several envelopes issued in June 1956. We had the registered envelopes, the eight and eight days. Um, we actually had, um, sorry, these are one of Tuppence Haitleys, I think. Well, I need to check that. Um, but also we had a new set of uh, non-registered envelopes. And indeed, um, uh, we also had the, the forces registration envelopes as well, or the inland, sorry, the, the non-inland ones. So I don't know exactly which product this notice applied to. If anybody does know, I'd be delighted to learn. So, I've just run through uh, the joys of collecting Queen Elizabeth postal stationery. What I haven't done, I mean, this is a tiny part of the story. Um, I could have showed you immense numbers of very similar looking envelopes and I decided that would be too tedious. Um, I didn't use uh, any of the non inland registered envelopes. Um, they're actually quite pretty because they're coloured. They're different, uh, they're not the battleship grey colours. Uh, but these were basically, you didn't know how much you were going to pay for a service going overseas, um, uh, particularly with using the forces envelope. So the envelopes had registration only. So they started off with six pence rather than eight pence eight And there are several barriers in that series. Um, I didn't bring any um, uh, mint on, sorry, used envelopes apart from that one that's up with eight one under the show. Um, and of course, there are seven different uh, inland indices, which I again didn't show. Um, if you do get bored and you really want to dig into this a bit more deeply, um, there's a, a five frame exhibit on the Royals website you can actually go and play with. And apart from that, that's all I've got to say. Oh, thank you, Frank. Um, back to you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Frank, for that most interesting uh, presentation, particularly archival material, I think always uh, interests everybody. Um, we next move on to questions, and um, that is in the capable hands of our host, Mark Bailey, um, and I will hand back to him uh, for him to handle the uh, questions from those attending. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Um, and uh, yeah, just to remind people, if you've got questions, the easiest way of getting them raised because there's 80 of us or so on this call is rather than to wave at us and expect us to see you waving um put your question in the chat box the chat box can be reached by putting your mouse over the zoom window little thing at the bottom then says chat you click in there and you can then type the message in and um, send it to everyone and we'll see it and to start frank um Harold Krieg has asked a question about the... Uh, Frank, would you like to unmute yourself? I was going to unmute when I needed to speak. <laughs> well, st stand by. Um, Harold Krieg has asked a question about the size numbers on the envelopes. You, you, he, he asks, of course, uh, about F, G, H and K. He says, do they stand for anything? Uh, they're just the code letter that uh, the post office used. Um, and these go right back to Victorian times. And if you look in the standard uh, textbooks, which mostly were written by um, Alan Huggins at some point, there's a great long list of what the letter codes were and the sizes that were associated with them. Now, the letters in between also exist, uh, but they weren't actually used for registra registration envelopes. Um, they did actually secretly change the dimensions of just by a few millimeters over the, over the years, but generally, Generally speaking, uh, those four letter codes are the ones which uh, are used in most reigns in British registered envelopes. So just to amplify the question, did they not also perhaps use A, B, C and D? Indeed, yeah. They did. They, they did use those. But they were not used for registered envelopes. OK. All right. Thank you. That, that, that was Harold's question. Thank you for the question there, Harold. Um, right. Have another question here from... Uh, Francis Podger. Francis says he noted that the diamonds in the original were quite sharp in the original image that you showed us. They seem to have become blunted as time went on. Was there a reason? I think it's quite simple that uh, with a sharp pencil or a single hair paintbrush you can build, you can draw quite a sharp point, but when you actually do it on a piece of metal and, and use it several million times it gets blunted. Okay. That would be my guess. All right. Um, Paul Davy asks a question. You know, you showed us obviously that the wrapper bands and the box labels. Paul would like to know 
is there a catalog or listing of the rapper bands and box labels anywhere? Um, George King, who's one of the doings of the Postal Stationery Society, <coughs> has produced such a list. Um, I don't think I've ever seen it published anywhere, um, but uh, if Paul contacts me off, uh, off this call, then uh, I'm sure we can come to some arrangement. Okay. Um, Francis uh, has a, another question, this time about the colour. You, you, you said about the, uh, the fact that they adopted this grey colour, as, as indeed we've seen. So, Fran so Francis's question is, was the red colour rejected as it was used for revenue embossing? I don't think so. Um, I defer to any expert in this field, which I'm not, but what, if you look in the, um, the standard catalogues on this, you'll see that the non-registered envelopes of many different values all had their own colours. And red was used for one of the values in the non-registered series. So I think it was just a simple question of avoiding con uh, confusion with it. Okay. Uta Dor asks, is it, uh, Frank, are you able to give information about handbooks or books uh, about this subject? Yeah, the, there are two really. Um, the, uh, the classic was produced by uh, Dr. Alan Huggins back in 1970. And um, of course that really annoyingly was published uh, about six months before the final value of the Tudor Rose design was issued. So it covers almost everything that I've been displaying today apart from the final uh, series of Tudor Rose designs. Uh, but the more recent book is called, I think it's called Click British Postal Stationery, which was a joint effort by um, Alan Huggins and Colin Baker. Uh, that is still the current book. It's very heavily sought after. It's sold out. Um, and whenever one comes up for sale, in fact, there was one in the, the Royals Literature Sale um, a month or so ago, and that fetched a very handsome price, second hand. Okay, so, but, so but, but, but that, Baker, um, Baker and Huggins is your best bet. Is, is, the, be, is, is the best handbook for that, right? Excellent. Well, that's an overview. If you want the underlying detail, you're going to come back to the original Huggins book. Mm -hmm. Ian Gregg asks, could you explain how the embossing and the, and the colouring was undertaken? Ah, right. Um, there's a fantastic book, which I, I do actually uh, use very readily and often, called The Fundamentals of Philately by the Williams Brothers. And it just so happens in that uh, particular book, it's on page, oh, this is sad if I'm right, it was page 430, something up from memory. <laughs> um, when it actually describes all of the processes, um, which the uh, McCorkadales undertook, there's a series of photographs in the book. And would you believe all the photographs were based at McCorkadales printing QE2 one of Thrupney registered envelopes? So we've got some fantastic contemporary photographs. In fact, the, that dates when the photographs were taken. And basically what happened was they started with a great big pile of um, paper. They uh, used a bit like a cookie cutter, if you know what I mean by that. They, they'd take about a dozen sheets of paper and they'd put them in a massively uh, powerful press and they'd cut out uh, the, the raw envelope shapes. They were called blanks, which is perhaps a reasonable title because there's nothing on it. Thank you. What page is it, Chris? Are you muted? Do we please know it's 430? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually quite worrying, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, thank you. Cup of tea's right. Um, so what they did, they took these blanks and they put them in a machine and they, they got several steps to go through. One was um, the printing of the blue ink. One is, and this is, this is actually a printing process, they got to put the glue on it. Yeah, and they've actually got two sorts of glue. One is the glue that actually manufactures the envelope and, and then folds into the envelope shape. And the other sort of glue is the bit you lick when you actually seal it. Yeah, so there's two sorts of glue to be apply, applied. You need to fold the envelopes. And if you think about a registered envelope, the actual embossed portion is actually embossed on the flap that sticks out. So the envelopes are actually made prior to the gray embossing. You've also got the phase of the blue typography. 
Now that's actually on both sides. So again, if you think about how they did it, they printed the blue prior to the folding. Yeah, and all of these were single step processes. So they used to cut, cut the blanks first and put them in uh, actually a series of different manual operations. Um, so first of all, it was blue printing, then it was uh, stick on the glue and fold it, um, press it so it sealed, uh, sorry, it actually uh, became an envelope rather than a piece of folded paper. And then they used to do the gray embossing. So it's a very, very, uh, ex um, a very expensive process to make them. So you can see that the end of the Tudor Rose design in 1970, they actually reverted to doing the whole thing by typography. Uh, and I have to say, I've never seen uh, any forgers, the typograph registered envelopes. I'm sure they must have been done. But if you go right back to the Penny Black, why on earth did they use Penny Black's so intricate design? It was to stop forgery. And I think that's true of the, the embossed envelopes because they started doing these in the 1840s embossed envelopes. Uh, but it took to 1970 to realize, particularly bear in mind how often they changed the value of them, that this actually wasn't a sensible way forward anymore. Right, well, thank you for that, Frank. And um, at the moment, that's the last question that I've seen. So I would say that we've- Oh, sorry, I, I just Have spotted Emil, Emil Minar's name pop up. Uh, yes. I, I can't see yes. a picture of Emil, but lovely to no, no, he, hear he, from you. <laughs> He is here. Um, let me see. He's Emil's in South Africa. At least he used to be. I don't know if he's still there. Yes, but oh. he hasn't. But he hasn't got a camera. That's why you're not seeing a picture oh, right. of him. Right. Um, question: Where can you get supplement to Alan Huggins' catalogues? Well, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any. Mark. Yes, Chris. I've tried unsuccessfully to send a chat question. Right, okay, so would you like to ask your question? May I read it instead? Yes, please. The K-size envelopes that I have are almost all the size that you've stated, but I have a three and fourpence envelope, which is 305 by 165, which in other words is larger than uh, normal. And I also have one 235 by 120. All these envelopes have on the back K-size envelopes. Yeah, th there's a simple answer to that, uh, Chris. Um, remember I said they, they have standards that, which are there to be broken. Um, and towards the end of the, uh, the 1960s, they did actually try and resize and redefine Ks. And you do actually get something called K2, which I thought was a mountain, but you actually get K2 and H2, which isn't a mountain. Uh, so if you read the standard textbooks, it will tell you which issues exist in which design. And I think actually, if you click onto the uh, the exhibit, which is uh, to go with this, you'll find examples there explained. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a very good question, Chris. Thank you. Um, oh, well, as I say, um, now that we've had Chris's question, I believe that is the final question. So I'd like to hand back to you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Um, may I now ask uh, Stephen Harrison to present the vote of thanks. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> I must first thank Richard for giving me the privilege of being able to give this vote of thanks for the display by Frank. Um, as some of you may know, my main collecting interest is registered mail. So when I knew that Frank was going to give this presentation, I was more than pleased. How can I describe this display? I think the one word that comes to mind is unique, both for the material and the research that's been undertaken by Frank. The material from Cecil Thomas's personal archive, which has been preserved in its entirety, is all unique. It has to be. Similar items, as Frank has told us, are not held in the Postal Museum or in the Royal Philatelic Collection. Even the Queen hasn't got this stuff. There are some items I must single out. The three photographic, uh, uh, photographic and ink essays, just superb. The colour trials, amazing. But why on earth did they choose the grey version? <laughs> when that superb red version was available. Can you imagine how much nicer all of that postal stationery would have looked? And the wrapper bands, um, so many times overlooked, I always think. 
I think the closest I've ever come to owning any of these items shown by Frank today is the florin, also designed by Cecil Thomas, because I know at some point I must have had one in my pocket. Um, as Frank pointed out in connection with this presentation, uh, he has produced an electronic exhibit on the subject and a handout document, which are both available, and I say this pr primarily for um, people who are joining us this afternoon who aren't members of the Royal, because it's available on the Royal website. Um, and all you have to do is go to the front page, click on news, events and meetings, and then you'll see a list of online presentations. You click on that and you can get to what you want. So I really would recommend you go and have a look at those, um, the, the, the presentation and the handout, because they contain such really incredible and useful information. I very often joke, jokingly say, when I view a display, right, how much of this material do I want to have? The more material that I want to have indicates how highly I rate the display. This afternoon, I want it all. <laughs> Thank you, Frank, for showing us such interesting and unique material and telling us such a good story. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Can I just, uh, can I just, uh, point of uh, clarification, the, the shortcuts to the, uh, to the material that Frank has made available to us are actually on the London meetings page. They're, they're not on the online presentations page. Yeah. Um, that's the specific um, page on the website where, where you'll see the links. There's, there's a section there about Frank's uh, presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, back to you, Richard, sorry. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Thank you, Stephen, for that uh, erudite uh, vote of thanks uh, on what I also found was, and I think everybody else has, an excellent presentation. Um, when I asked Frank if he would uh, do the presentation uh, and then moved on to considering who might uh, do the vote of thanks, uh, your name immediately sprang to mind because, of course, you share that interest in registered envelopes. And I, too, have found it absolutely fascinating. There's, there's one, one comment that I wanted to make to Frank. Um, when we looked at the early uh, material, there was a used item, um, registered envelope, addressed to Clark's office, High Street, Rochester, Kent. And it was 19, late 1950s. Now, in the early 1960s, in my first uh, job that I had working in the magistrate's court, I was in the cash office. And I must, over two years, have handled not hundreds, but thousands of registered envelopes because maintenance money was paid by the husband and it arrived in the office in a registered envelope, much of it, and it was paid out in registered envelopes, which were sent in by those who wished to receive the money that way. And every day I took probably between 40 and 60 uh, registered envelopes to the post office to post them and I ignored the envelopes completely I was a stamp collector at the time but uh, many thousands of them went through my hands and those of my colleagues who worked in the uh, in the cash office and I suspect that that one addressed to clerk's office in, in Rochester was probably addressed to the magistrate's clerk's office um, Thank you again for this excellent presentation. We're moving towards closing the meeting. There are a couple of uh, announcements that uh, I would like to, to make, if that's all right. Um, I am looking for more volunteers to do virtual presentations uh, to members of the society worldwide, because as I have said, I think in one of my newsletters that uh, having let this genie out of the bottle, uh, we can't put it back and we need to continue holding uh, these presentations. There are many members out there who I think have the facility and the willingness to do a presentation to uh, members worldwide. And if you wish to consider doing one, please email me. The sort of thing that we're looking for is an unusual subject, 
a different subject, one that particularly interests you and where you have the expertise. And the sort of time scale is a presentation lasting between 25 and 35 minutes with the use of PowerPoint to display the key items that you wish to just to talk about. And something between 25 and 35 slides is the normal uh, number that each presenter uses. That's just a rough guide. We like to be flexible. And if you'd like to, be, to, to do a presentation, do contact me on uh, president at rpsl.org.uk. The next presentation will be on the 12th of November, and that will be Gerald Mar Mariner, who um, his level of area of expertise, or one of them, he's got several, is the uh, German occupation of the Channel Islands. And he likes to look not just at occupation mail, but mail that was affected by the occupation in being transferred from one island to the other, um, as well as external and, and, and mail, and mail um, going out from the islands themselves to other countries. That will be followed on the 26th of uh, November by a presentation by Simon uh, Martin Redman, and his title is Pirates, Population and Posts and is, is the development of the postal services in Sarawak. Now, my next newsletter will go out next week on Wednesday, the 4th of November. I used to send them out on Thursdays or Fridays, but Friday being Guy Fawkes Day, the 5th of November, is probably not a good idea to send it out, despite the fact that most uh, people will be in lockdown. Um, so there will be further details about the next two presentations there. Um, I am looking now to have whole presentations during January. I suspect that as a precaution, we will need to have them scheduled for the next couple of months as well. I'm in the process of discussing the physical presentations with all those left in my program. And uh, I think given the latest government announcements and, and uh, predictions about how this coronavirus is, is likely to develop, then I think um, changes will be have to be made and you will be notified as soon as uh, further information is available. Um, once again, thank you to everybody for joining this meeting. It's been most enjoyable. It's been very instructive for me, despite the fact that I'm very familiar with the design of, of registered envelopes during the early part of, of uh, the Queen's reign. Um, and I look forward to as many members as possible joining us uh, at the next meeting. Um, one thing I, I haven't yet done is, and Mark, I think you have the certificate ready to display. I do. I will, I will display it now. All presenters receive a certificate signed by me. Um, it's Hope shown now right. virtually yeah. and uh, a hard copy will be received by Frank in the, with our very best wishes uh, in, in due course through Royal Mail. I'm afraid it won't arrive by registered mail though. Okay, right. With that then, uh, may I formally close the meeting, but we will continue to be online for everyone who wishes to remain and to chat about any subject that you wish to raise.